Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Debbie Riley, and I proudly work for Belmont Village Senior Living. Today, we're excited to present Your Memory is Your Story, featuring Mary Lou Henner and Patricia Will. All, all attendees will have their audio and video disabled. You can ask questions in the Q&A box on your screen. Our host is Patricia, founder and CEO of Belmont Village, founded in 1997. Patricia is known throughout the industry and is in the Senior Housing Hall of Fame and the Texas Business Hall of Fame. Thank you, Patricia, for hosting this wonderful discussion with Mary Lou. Thank, Thank you, Debbie. Debbie. And what a pleasure it is for me to be broadcasting live from our Hollywood community in Los Angeles with Mary Lou Henner, <laughs> who just lives a couple of minutes from here. <laughs> Mary Lou would be fascinating enough if we were to simply focus on her acting career. On stage as Marty, she was the perfect foil for Travolta's Duty in Greece. <laughs> she landed the role of Roxy in Chicago. And in the movies, she was a leading lady opposite everyone from Burt Reynolds to Steve Martin. That said, for me, the best of all was her role as the unforgettable Elaine Nardo in the hit TV series, Taxi. The list goes on. Uh, she just described filming in Canada during the pandemic, <laughs> and uh, we'll talk about her next film, hopefully, in a while. I love the night she got fired on Trump's Celebrity <laughs> Apprentice, or more Twice. recently, her magical samba with Derek on <laughs> Dancing with the Stars. Even as she continued to act, Mary Lou embarked upon an equally rich career as a writer and lecturer founded in her passion for healthy living. Her explanation, exploration of the critical elements of well-being were first memorialized in 1998 when she published The Total Health Makeover, which became an instant New York Times bestseller. More recently, she published The Total Memory Makeover, which brings me to the most unique attribute of this extraordinary woman, her memory. <laughs> Mary Lou Henner is one of only 12 individuals in the world who have no, are known to have hyperthamnesia, not amnesia, but hyperthamnesia, better known as highly superior autobiographical memory or HSAM. A woman of my age, she can recall every detail of every day since she was 12 and most details since she was seven, a feat that has been documented and studied at UC Irvine. While none of us have this rare gift, it is just like Mary Lou to want to share what we can do to enrich our own lives by improving our powers to recollect. Actress, producer, author, podcaster, and friend, it's my great pleasure to introduce Mary Lou Henner. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. What a great introduction. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, meeting you a few weeks ago over Zoom, we, I knew we were kindred spirits. I just already adore you. We've been like talking during this whole setup and I just thought, oh my gosh, we have to like do something more together because it's really, first of all, this place is great. I do live a minute and a half from here. So when I, you know, I first heard about it, I said about doing, giving a speech, I thought, well, let me go down to the Belmont and actually do it. And then you said you were gonna be in town. So it worked out great. And I love sharing information with people. I don't know it's because I'm a middle child of six kids, but I love sharing with people anything that I've learned. And so I'm excited about being able to talk to you today about memory, because just think about it. Your memory is your story. Every single thing you have ever been through is on your emotional hard drive, and it makes you behave in certain ways, whether or not you're even aware of it. You might meet somebody and say, oh, why, why do I feel like oh, this is my best friend? <laughs> or why do I feel like, oh my gosh, I don't like that person? Or why do I feel like there's something about a smell in a room that reminds me of something? We're constantly using our memory, and our memory is part of our story. Okay, is our story. All right, so I wanna give you a little background about myself. I grew up in a really 
in a very wild way because my family had a dancing school in the backyard, a beauty shop in our kitchen. We had art classes going on upstairs because my uncle lived upstairs with 10 cats, two dogs, two birds, a skunk, 150 fish, and his boyfriend, Charles. He taught art at the Catholic grammar school next door. We had backstage passes to Catholicism because we were right next door. And the nuns came over not only for stretch classes, but to get their hair cut. Okay, because my mom did it all. She even took them bra shopping at Vassaret, which was a factory near, near the house. Okay, so I had this very colorful childhood and people would say, well, of course you remember everything. But as one of six kids, I was known as memory girl, the memory kid. They called me Univac, which was the old first computer. And I was known, you know, when you're one of six kids, you're so lucky to feel like there's something different about you. So for me, it was that I had this very unusual memory. People would say to my, my parents, well, why does she remember the last day I was here and what I was wearing and what the date was? And at six years old, I could put myself to sleep saying, what did I do a year ago in kindergarten? What did I do when I was exactly to the day as old as my little brother, Lauren? You know, and so what happened was it was definitely a nature nurture. I was definitely born with something unusual, but I definitely exercised it because it was like something I wore very proudly. All right, so as someone who remembers virtually every day of my life, and here's the sad part that I've discovered in all of this memory research. <clears throat> Most people remember only eight to 11 events during any given year. If I said to you 1997, or if I said to you 2003 or 2018, you would probably remember only eight to 11 events within that year. And to me, that's so sad because I remember the whole year, but also I feel like, oh, have we just gotten lazy? Are we just using our smartphones? Are we relying on too many other things to sort of prompt our memories? So my goal is to try to help people with their memories. Now, how do I do that? Well, as someone who's looking from the inside out of a really good memory, I started to realize that everyone remembers something especially well. Everyone has what I call their primary track. It's like in the jigsaw puzzle of your life, what are the hard edged pieces by which you can start interlocking the other memories to. Everyone, I don't care who you are, and I've had so many people say to me, oh, I don't remember anything. I don't know what you're talking about. I have a terrible memory. No, I don't believe that. I believe everyone remembers something especially well. And it could be anything from places you've lived, places you've traveled, travel's a big one, places you've studied, your children's lives. I've heard hair, I've heard food, you know, hairdos. I've heard food, I've heard uh, sports, big, big one. Some guys will forget their wife's birthday or their anniversary, but they will remember a game from 32 years ago, what the score was, what they were wearing, what the plays were like. So everyone remembers something especially well. And it's what I call your primary track. That's the jigsaw puzzles, the hard edge jigsaw puzzle pieces of your life that you could start you know, connecting the other pieces to. Okay, everyone is also, my belief, everyone also is a sight, sound, touch, taste, or smell person. Everyone has a dominant sense. Now, a visual person, you know, a sight person might remember something that happens in a visual way, or they remember directions when they see uh, you know, a map. Other people, have to hear something to have it really stick to their minds, have it stick to their brains. And other people, like a smell will take them right back. Or a, the music, of course, that's also auditory. And textures, you know, as an actress, I've been very lucky to really explore a lot of different sense memories because one of the sense memory exercises that you do as an actor is you're trying to bring something into your class that has an emotional response right away. So it would be a picture or a texture or a piece of music or whatever it is. And you know, people would say, well, how do you get there so fast? And I think like, well, how do you not? But I didn't know that my memory was all that unusual back then. Okay, so if you figure out your primary track and your dominant sense, you can figure out how you receive, retain, and then retrieve memories. Because the people who have HSAM, we happen to have an extraordinary retrieval system, but everyone can have a better retrieval system if you really study how it is that you absorb the memories. Because you can't 
remember anything that you don't pay attention to. And because we're walking around like this all the time, we're paying less attention to our lives. You know, I mean, people will remember, it's interesting, people will remember their childhood phone number more than they will remember their current phone number, or they won't, will, you know, they, they won't remember their best friend's current phone number or their husband or wife's current phone number at work or their work number, because they're so used to using the smartphone. Okay, so I'm always very interested in trying to get people to use their strengths. What is your primary track? What is your dominant sense? Okay, now, little sidebar. When we were kids, we used to have these extraordinary parties because of the dancing school. And my father used to say that every event has anticipation, participation, and recollection. And the greatest of these is recollection. We used to like anticipate a party. We used to like live the party. And then we'd have a recollection session the day after the party to talk about the party. And that sometimes the recollection party was more fun than the actual party. So I started to see everything in life in this A, P, R way. Anticipation, participation, and recollection. Like up until I was here, I was anticipating today. Now I'm participating. Now tomorrow I'll be thinking about it or later today. Anticipation, participation, recollection. All day long, you are in one of those states about any single thing. If I ask any person out there, what are you anticipating? What are you participating? Well, you're participating hopefully in this right now. And what are you recollecting from before? So you have to think of memory as kind of this cycle, okay? All right, so we've got the primary track, we've got the dominant sense, we have the APR, anticipation, participation, and recollection, and you're constantly in this cycle. Okay, now, the other thing I want, and I'm, I'm giving you like a, a, a speech for a certain amount of time, and then we're gonna have time for questions, but I want to get this information so that you have it. Okay, there are also four different types of memory retrieval, all right? Four different ways that we go to memories to try to remember what they were. And these four ways that I've named are called horizontal, vertical, mushrooming, mushrooming, and sporadic. This is what they mean. And they're kind of fun names to remember. All right, if I said to you, Patricia, how was that wedding you went to a couple of weeks ago? And you said, oh my gosh, it was great. We got there Friday, we had a rehearsal dinner, we met at the bar afterwards. Saturday, I got up and I did a, a power walk. Then I got dressed for the wedding, the wedding was beautiful. And you tell me in a very horizontal, linear way. And that's how many people describe certain things, horizontally, mm -hmm. okay. But if I said, Patricia, how was that wedding you went to a few weeks ago? And you said, oh, it was great. I, at the reception, I got involved in a conversation with my cousin. We hadn't seen each other in a long time. We sat down and we just downloaded on everything in the family. And you probably could go deeper and deeper and deeper into that fixed point in that memory. It's like a vertical memory. You'd, you could probably tell me the wallpaper, the songs that were playing while you were talking, the themes of what you were talking about, what she was dressed like, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the third way is mushrooming. If I said to you, Patricia, how was that wedding you went to a few weeks ago? And you said, oh my gosh, I met somebody there. We had lunch two weeks later. Uh, we're gonna do a project together. It was fantastic. I asked you about something and it mushroomed to something that was connected to it and sort of grabbed your memory. And now you're talking about this other thing. But if I said, okay, Patricia, how was that wedding you went to a few weeks ago? And you said, oh my gosh, there was somebody there who looked exactly like my old boss and right away, I was back in my desk looking at this guy. He used to take credit for my you know, work and he was such a jerk and everything else. You've now spored to something else that has nothing to do with the wedding, but there it is. Okay, so all day long, we have these things that happen to us. Horizontal memories, vertical memories, mushrooming memories, and sporadic memories. So these are all different ways that we retrieve memories. Okay, what is... What is the importance of all of this? First of all, I think people don't realize how much better their memory is than they ever thought before. We always think that memory has to do with memorization. It's looking at a list and being able to remember a list. It's using a memory palace, which I still don't understand why or how that works, because that to me would just be confusing. 
Uh, it's, it's looking at things in a two-dimensional way instead of a three-dimensional way. And it's funny, Patricia and I were just talking about how Zoom is so two-dimensional. So you sometimes miss some things in just a Zoom way. I hope I'm, I wanna like reach out to all of you so I'm not just two-dimensional right now. And it's funny because people always say to me, um, what about lines? You must be really good at lines. And I always say, well, lines are like two dimensions. So it's a little different. I will remember not only the lines, but I, I will remember where I was when I read the script, what the character's life reminded me of in my own life, what I was wearing, what the weather was like, you know, all of those other things. So it's like, we have to start thinking of our memories as more three-dimensional, as more exp experiential. We have to think of our memories as our attention units cannot be just focused on us or our smartphones. Our attention units have to be taking in the world because you can't remember what you don't pay attention to. So we have to pay attention. Okay, eight to 11 events within a given year. I am determined to change that. I want people to pay more attention so they don't just have eight to 11 at the end of each year. So how do you do that? Okay. You're gonna figure out your primary track, you're gonna figure out your dominant sense, and then you're gonna to play to your strength. So let's say you're a visual person and you're gonna use your smartphone. Every day, take some kind of picture of like, oh, this is the picture of the day. I'm here in this room, I'm at Belmont Village. Let me take a photograph and this will be like my picture of the day. And I'm gonna put it someplace. And then tomorrow I'm going to take another picture of like, oh, I'm at the, you know, I'm at the Grove and I'm going to take a picture, right? Or something. And I'm just going to put all those pictures somewhere else on my phone. And then at the end of the month, I'll say, okay, how many of those pictures can I actually remember? How many of those things can I bring to mind again? And I'm going to concentrate and try to figure out how do I bring more than one or not even one per month? And if you can bring back three and you start exercising your brain, so you're bringing three to this month and then carry that three to the next month and three, you're going to have 36 at the end of the year instead of six, instead of eight to 11. Okay. So that's really important to start exercising your mind as if it's a, a muscle, just like exercising, like walking, like anything else. Let's say you're an auditory person. So what you're going to do is you're going to, at some point in the day, you're going to say, Okay, I'm going to do a sound check. What is the sound of the day that will call to mind this day when I want to think about it later? All right, so you have to figure out your dominant sense. And this is what else you do. Okay, at the end of the day, when you are brushing your teeth, because that's two minutes, we're all supposed to be brushing our teeth for two minutes. My, my toothbrush tells me, it, it like stops after two minutes. Okay, those two minutes, scroll through your day recall to mind, just scroll through the montage of your day and try to remember like, what did I do today? Let me wake up, let me, what did I do first thing? What did I, okay, I did this, I did that, this was the day. And see what is worth remembering. What is sticky in your brain that was maybe like, oh, I had a great conversation with Patricia. Oh, I had a, like a wonderful time at Belmont. Oh, I had like, a, it was beautiful weather. You know, whatever it is. Recall to mind, run it through a second time because the second time is gonna make you remember it. And then you can jot it down, take, write down three bullet points, whatever. You have got to remember more than eight to 11 events within any given year because that's, you're cheating. You're cheating yourself out of using your life in the best possible way. It's so important to use our autobiographical memory to make decisions, to recall failures, to recall successes, See, memory is tied to adrenaline. They have proven that. So that's why people will remember the highs and the lows. You will remember all the great things that happened to you, like a first kiss, the birth of a baby, your wedding day, or three wedding days in my case, because I'm on my third and final husband. But you know, three things that, so all the good things that happened to you. You'll also remember the crappy things that happened to you, being embarrassed in school, forgetting an assignment, being fired, being like not, not pulling off something that you wanted to do. You will remember those things. But the more you study and 
create and, and strengthen your autobiographical memory, the more you're going to be able to bring back all those little middle of the road moments in your life. So it's not just the highs and the lows, it's all those things that really make up the fabric of your life. You know, my, my siblings will say to me, Mayor, do a week from our childhood. You know, they want me to like bring back something that we did years ago in the sixties or something. And so I will like say, okay, and then I'll go take like a week in whatever month and, and I'll walk through the entire you know, week with them. And the, the baseball game we played on the corner and who washed the dishes that night and what our mother served or whatever. You know, it's like so many things are in there and not just, I just happen to have a, an unusual retrieval system. They wired me, put me through an MRI, took 300 measurements of my brain and found nine areas 10 times larger than the normal brain. But I know, I know that half of what I can do or, or why I have this is because I worked at it and I loved it and I loved remembering because I felt like I could use my life as life lessons. So what's the importance of this? Okay, if all we do is we wake up, we live our lives, we turn off the light, we go to sleep. We wake up, we live our lives, we turn off the light, we go to sleep. And if nothing moves forward, then what does it mean? So to me, developing a stronger, you know, a, a much better autobiographical memory. It's really our strongest line of defense against meaninglessness that we have. Because if you have the access to your life, you can use the past to bring it to the present and let it inform a better future. You can say, oh my gosh, this is a red flag. Where have I been through this before? Yes, I remember that boss. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna be careful. I'm gonna look out for jerks like that. Oh my gosh, what, why? Oh, I'm about to go in and ask for a promotion. When was the last time I felt really good about something? Oh yes, let me use that. Let me build my confidence that way. You're using your life to help your life and to help your future. I know we're probably running out of time now and I don't want to you know, overshoot my welcome, but I'm so excited to talk about memory to you guys. Mary Lou, I cannot thank you enough for that introduction. And I have to tell you that um, the total memory makeover sits on my night table. Oh. It's a great exception because with my business day, I normally just read novels in foreign languages. <laughs> um, Good for you. Wow. As a visual person, um, the idea of taking a photograph of various moments of the day has come to me. And it's something that I do. It can be an architectural detail or a smile on someone's face. So this is terrific advice. Oh, thank you. Now, I have to say, um, and I may embarrass him a little bit, but since Michael, your husband, guess the third, um, who you met in college but didn't hook up with then. No, no. No, I was the girlfriend code. He was my roommate's boyfriend, so I didn't dare twinkle. Came uh, into your life again uh, and reconnected much later. Yes. Just to demonstrate how this works. Can you tell me about that first encounter where years later, oh. where you were, what you wore, what day it was? Oh, sure, sure, sure. All of those things. Sure, absolutely. Okay, so he called me. It was like February the 22nd of 2003. Well, I had gotten a divorce and my divorce was final on September the 27th, in, <laughs> um, 2002. And so, um, yeah, it was a Friday. And, uh, and so to February 22nd of 2003, all of a sudden, I hear his voice on the phone. It was like, hi, it's Mike Brown, uh, University of Chicago, blast from the past, you know, running. And I, like my heart was pounding, heart was pounding, heart was pounding. A little sidebar, a friend of mine had sent me to a psychic and the psychics predicted that there was going to be an M in my life. And what's funny is that I would like, people would try to, you know how like when you're divorced, well, I don't know if you ever went through that, but so, uh, you know, you go through your sweepstakes period. So friends were trying to fix me up. And because of this psychic in my head, I said to somebody, uh, oh, what's his name? Oh, is there an M in there? And it was like, oh, his middle name's M. Okay, yeah, I'll go out with, you know, with there was Anyway, when Michael called, I remember just sliding down my bathroom wall going, it's the M. You know, I just had this feeling. So we made a date for a week later. We we're supposed to go two weeks later, but we both wanted to see each other. And that was March 1st. Um, I wore uh, the, like these black sort of palazzo type pants with this vegan leather little top that was kind of sexy. I thought, I don't want to be easy access in case, you know, anything happens, but what? But anyway, so he wore like an outfit that his girls picked out for him, which was so not like him because he's dresses in a more classic way. So he had this very kind of balloony kind of shirt and these pants that were beige. And yeah, and so that was our first date was March 1st 
of 2003. It was a Saturday. And within a week, we were saying, I love you. We're going to spend the rest of our lives together. And within two months, he was diagnosed with bladder cancer, stage 2, 3 bladder. And then two months later, um, lung cancer. But he's been in remission now almost 18 years. We nursed him back to health. No chemo, no radiation. He didn't have to lose his bladder. They wanted to cut it all out. And, you know, we had like a whole nother story that we wrote called um, Changing Normal, How I Helped My Husband Beat Cancer and about being a caregiver and what it's like to be a caregiver for someone you love. But he's been the love of my life forever. And we, you know, have built a real life together the last 18 years. But so there's a parallel um, in thinking about memory and thinking about healthy living. How does nurturing your memory help you to live healthy? And how does living healthy, as you define it, help you with memory? Yeah, well, it's a mind-body connection. I mean, we can't like separate them anymore. And there's also, you know, thinking about plaque on your teeth, plaque on your heart, plaque on your brain. I've done a lot of Alzheimer's research. I've spoken in front of Congress nine times. And most recently about with us against Alzheimer's, about getting more funding for clinical trials and all kinds of the research that Alzheimer's so needs, Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, but, you know, it's like what's good for your body is good for your brain. You know, you've got to move. I always say motion is the lotion. Motion is the lotion. You know, we are this beautiful human animal. We walk our dog, our cat stretches, we get a hamster wheel. We have to move as well. It's crucial that we move. We have to move. We have to think clearly. We have to have relationships with people. Interacting with people is so important. And every single thing that we put into our bodies builds something somewhere. You wouldn't use crappy materials to build a house. So why would you want to use bad food to build your brain and your body. So there's definitely a mind, a, a mind body connection. And it's important for us to layer information and to take care of ourselves so that we wake up every day and say, okay, what does this day hold for us? What can we do? How can we improve our life from yesterday, you know, and the layering of information so that we remember to take care of ourselves. People always say, you know, I used to weigh 70, uh, how much more? That's 55 pounds more than I do now. I mean, I've written all kinds of books about health and I got into health after both of my parents died very young. But I, people always say, well, how did you, you know, how did you stay in shape once you figured all this out? And I said, because I remembered how it, good it felt to be in shape. I remembered how to take care of myself. I remembered, I layered the information and I didn't want to go back to the way I felt before, you know? So using your memory, makes a big difference in your life. So I want to talk a little bit um, and probe, not anymore about Michael, we'll leave you out of it for <laughs> a moment, but talk about the memory and relationships. Um, I've been um, with my husband, who I met uh, actually in high school, uh, for 46 years. Wow. And um, as I think about uh, improving my recollection, I worry a little bit about whether that will tip our relationship in one way or another. Uh, can it be destructive to remember absolutely everything? <laughs> well, are you insinuating that that's why I'm on, on my third and final I'm husband? I'm not insinuating <laughs> anything. I'm kidding. No, you know what? I think the more you remember, the more kind of forgiving you are because you realize, oh, that person had a bad day. Or, oh, I remember when we went through this before we got over it by just getting away from each other for, you know, a, a few hours and letting both of us kind of calm down, you know, oh yeah, he's saying what he always says. And I'm just going to, it's going to go over my head that time. You know, I think also you get, I always call it this. I always think of it as like flaps up, you know, it's like sometimes you have to just go flaps up and imagine that your earlobes are closing yours because it's like the noise of the other person. I mean, we've only been together 18 years, but I can't even imagine 46, except I would love to have 46 years with him. But I feel like, you know, sometimes you just have to let things go. And I think when you have a good memory, you tend to let things go a lot more easily than people realize. People always say, are you a grudge holder? Are the people who have this a grudge holder? And I always think like, no, because you say, oh, it's, I used to say, no, because you understand it's like, you know, so many different shades of gray. And then once the books came out, I couldn't use that as an example anymore. Correct. You know? Yeah. So um, staying with that, um, when you're in a relationship, if you have a perfect memory, can the other guy ever win an argument? Did you talk to Michael about this? No, I just I'm to looking know. at him across the room. I have a great advantage in that we have eye contact. <laughs> That's so funny because we just went through something. 
It's so funny because we go, because sometimes I want to say like, don't embarrass yourself. Don't take me on in this. But I don't. I used to, but now I don't. But no, yeah, he can, he can, he wins other ways. He wins other ways. He's okay. an extraordinary person, but you know, um, for in terms of details. Yeah. So, so sticking with this for just a second, sure. let's switch to your kids. Uh, you're uh, the mother of two sons. Uh, you have Michael's children in your life. And now you have an extended family of a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. Well, they're six and eight six now. Six and eight yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that are living with you. Um, what is it like for kids to grow up with a mom who remembers everything? <laughs> well, they have really good memories too. But my boys love it because they'll say, mom, what was the date of the blah, blah, blah? Mom, use your memory. When do we do blah, blah, blah? You know, but they might, you know, my son will sometimes take me on. And one of them really has an extraordinary memory. So I'll like mess with him, my, my Joey. And I will say like, oh yeah, that happened on Wednesday. He'll go, no, you must be losing it. I'm calling 60 minutes. That was a Thursday. And I go, okay, gotcha. You know, <laughs> so I like to play with it. And the two little kids have great memories too. I'm very big on teaching people how to use their memories. You know, when I, I went on the road with Annie, get your gun. And my boys started the, the, the tour when they were just um, four and a half and six. And I made them keep a diary. And I always say that in a fire, I, it's the first thing I would say, because it's their little handwritings and mm -hmm. you can see how much how, how progressive they, you know, their handwritings became, but I constantly refresh their memories to this day. And that was like a long time ago because they're, they, they're 25 and a half and 27. So it was a while ago, 2000 to 2001, I will say, okay, what city did we do next? What did we do? And it's that constant, you know, refresh. And they remember all the kids' names that they were playing with and were traveling with us. And, you know, you just, you have to, sometimes you have to refresh to have it really get seared into your brain so and it's great I mean what's funny is that my boys will see me with the little kids and they'll say oh mom I see that you're doing this with them the way you used to do it with us you know because I it's, it's so funny because the other day Catherine uh, Joe had to go home so I picked her up from school and she said where's Joe and I said oh he's not feeling well so daddy picked him up and I'm picking you up and she said oh well, let's go get Joe a present and I said okay so we went to the mall and we got him a present and I said Catherine this is known as retail therapy. <laughs> you have to remember, this is a big mo moment in your life. You're six, this is called retail therapy. <laughs> we were laughing. And so like once I said to her last night, I said, what was that thing we did when we got Chopra? And she said, retail therapy. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, you're teaching her well. <laughs> so a lot of people think of perfect memory as photographic memory. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you look at something and you know absolutely everything. And yet, I've heard you say that it's not the same thing. Can you no. explain that to us? Well, it's kind of what I was saying before about how, how photographic memory is a snapshot. So it's two dimensional. It's like I know people who can literally look at a page of dialogue and in one, one look, it's in their brain. I'm not like that. It maybe takes me two or three because where my mind goes first is, you know, where am I? What is this character saying? that that I can relate to in my own life you know what is her was her experience and also as an actress I, probably, I hope I'm okay with sound I'm forgetting to not hit the sound um I I used to as an actress think like okay I'm going to be little miss perfect memory I'm going to memorize the dialogue I'm going to know and I'm going to do it the same way all the time and I found myself like cutting off impulses as an actress where it's different every time, you know, you want it to be different. The person that you're in the scene with is it's different when they say their lines than what you've practiced at home. So I have to learn how to not just have my perfect little memory. I have to be in the moment with the person, know my dialogue and why I'm saying it, what the intention of the character is, what the character wants in the scene. But I have to like ride the wave of what I'm doing with that person. And maybe they're doing a different take this time. And I, it opened me up so much as an actress once I realized I could do that, gave myself permission. So let's talk about you as an actress for a second. Sure. I know that the focus is memory, um, but your career is extraordinary and hopeful to me Thank at you. the same time. And the reason that I say that is because we're constantly fed a diet here in LA that those of us who are older um, are done. Right. Um, and that um, there aren't roles for um, women um, except the wicked grandmother. 
Um, Those are fun to play, though. Yeah, Let me they tell you something. Be very fun to play. <laughs> um, and uh, that uh, we've had it. Um, so you continue to be a leading lady. Um, you're doing stage. You're doing one woman shows. You're doing uh, TV series that you've been filming all pandemic mm -hmm. um, and, and, and film. Um, talk about the evolution, if you will, um, not only of your career, but how you see women um, in this extraordinary industry that's headquartered right here in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. Well, as, as a little girl, I used to say I want to be a writer and I want to be an act. I want to be an actress and I want to be a writer and I want to have two boys. I'm going to have two boys. I just always knew I was going to have two boys. I, I knew I'd have probably more than one husband, but I always said that I wanted to have, I, I'm going to have two sons. And I just knew that it was like a weird kind of thing. Um, even at 14, I wrote that down that I'm going to have two boys and I did. But um, I think one of the things that's been really good for me is that I'm, I love being a student. I love learning new things. I love trying new things. And when you don't stay totally fixated on a plan A, like I'm only going to be a leading lady, or I'm only going to do this, I'm only going to do that. You, you close a whole tunnel of opportunities that's plan B. At, at 17, after my parents died, I came up with this theory, and that was the key to your life is how well you deal with plan B. Because plan A is what you plan for, you hope for, you dream, you prepare for it, and then plan B is what actually happens. And sometimes you can be dragged kicking and screaming to plan B. And sometimes you can say, well, what's around this corner? You know, what, what is there an opportunity there? Or is there, what, what am I learning from this plan B experience? And I think for me, making the adjustment constantly, like I just didn't want to, I couldn't have been just an, I shouldn't say just an actress. I, could, I didn't want to only be an actress. I wanted to do other things. And then within acting, I knew there were other opportunities that if I left myself open to, maybe they would come my way as well. You know, I'm, I've got this whole new thing that I'm doing that just started during the pandemic. I'm dubbing foreign films for Netflix, which is like so crazy to me because I got this opportunity to audition and it worked. And then they asked me to dub for somebody. And then I didn't get to do that one because she was able to then dub her own film. But then it just opened up a whole new career and I've done four of them in the last few months. And it's like so challenging and so exciting. And I'm like, I just wanna be so much better at this because I love dubbing myself because you're like remembering when you were breathing and what you were doing, but, but dubbing for somebody else that's speaking a foreign language and now you have to put your words into their mouth. It's like super mathy and challenging and memory, a lot of memory. So, you know, I, I think the more you are a student of life and you leave yourself open and you don't become very dogmatic about what you won't do, or what you will do. You know, I, I've probably missed a lot of things that I, you know, people would say, well, why are you taking that job? And I'll say, well, because it sounds interesting to me and it's a great location, even though the script's not good. And then something else would come out of it, you know? So it's like the plan, leaving myself open to plan B and what was being offered or what was possibly an opportunity. I just never shut the doors. You know, I'm, I'm very, you know how improv is yes and. I think when you have sort of a yes and attitude, which I did growing up with a big family of six kids, yes and, yes and let's do this. And not like, no, you know, so. So I, I feel um, given that we're the same age, um, kind of that it's okay to ask this question sure. because people ask me this question all the time. Do you ever think about retiring? <laughs> You know what? I love what I do. When you love what you do, you don't think of it as like oh, a job that I have to, you know, it's still yeah. somewhat, you know, you know, it, it's like if you have energy. I watched my mother who was a dance teacher. She had six kids. She was in, in great shape. She had terrible rheumatoid arthritis after my father died because he died in such a shocking way. And I just saw her whole life kind of fall apart after that. But she would feed us and then go out to the dance studio and teach her classes. And she loved what she did. And, and having a mother that made us fall in love with, falling in love with the work that we do and falling in love with movement, you know, was just like such a head start in life. But I love what I do. I love, I was talking about that the other day. I said that if you, 
if you love what you do and you're constantly leaving yourself open, like, oh, what's around this corner, you know? And how do you swizzle stick it all? <laughs> so I want to come back and and you're so way, such a good interview. This is so much fun. So I want to come back to the Netflix dubbing because sure. I am a lover and speaker of multiple languages, but oh. I cannot imagine. And I so I watch my Netflix in the in language. The language comes yeah. in, I cannot imagine what it would be like to have to dub and lip sync to somebody else's breathing. Right. Um, it's crazy. And French do, is the hardest because you, they, they have so many syllables. So how do you, so do, have you done do French? And I've done do French, it? two French movies. Oh, I've wow. done a French, a German, and an Italian. Oh, wow. It's crazy. Okay, so, so French is Spanish the hardest. Spanish will probably be the easiest. Probably, yeah, maybe. maybe. I haven't done yeah. Spanish yet, but yeah. All right. Isn't that crazy? German, German was actually the easiest because the phonemes are similar to English. But French, oh my gosh, because their mouths are going and you think like, oh, I want to take my time with the scene, but I've got to like, you know, it's like crazy. I cannot imagine doing yeah. that. Um, you know, that really brings up uh, the, the advent of Netflix was there before the pandemic, but now we've, oh. we're, we're accessing all of it's the a, content it's, from all, of, all yeah, over the world. It's a verb now, Netflix and chill. Are we going to get back into the theaters to watch you? We are going to get back into the theaters, but I think a lot of people are just going to stay home you know it's like so expensive to go and play paper print but there are some films that have to be seen on a big screen or should be seen on a big screen you know but i think i'll tell you what i'm really hoping i'm really hoping and this isn't just netflix this was disney plus watching hamilton on disney plus the day it opened i remember it was friday what day it was. july 3rd <laughs> friday july 3rd 2020 candace cameron Ray and i were like quarantining and we were like oh no we're seeing this being able to see Hamilton on Disney Plus and seeing how they filmed the live production, but also had cameras super close so you could really see their faces. Two things. One, it was an extraordinary experience to see the show in person, and I saw it four times, but also to see it up close like that where you really saw their expressions. It's a completely different experience. But all I kept thinking was now all the high school productions of Hamilton will have that as a base. People will have seen the original Broadway company. So we will have been spared <laughs> some high school productions that won't understand what is really going on because they that's can a, use that as a reference. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. I'll yeah. think of that as my grandchildren do this <laughs> yeah. when they get there. Yes. Um, older people and, and people, especially our age, um, have a fear of losing short term memory. I know. Um, and you talked about your devotion to finding solutions for Alzheimer's disease. We share that. Right. Uh, whether it's fundraising, whether it's public speaking, all of those kinds of things. You have mastered in an extraordinary way long term memory. I have a question here from a woman who lives in our Lincoln Park community in Chicago, who is asking, what are the secrets even for someone who may have short-term memory decline for retrieving the old stories? Oh, the old stories? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, first of all, the repetition of new stories. I mean, when, when you get new information, repeat it. Repeat someone's name. Repeat what you're doing. Think about, you know, I always say people like would use a memory palace kind of thing of do, doing a grocery list. If you're going grocery shopping, don't think of your kitchen as much as you think of the store. What's my Whole Foods or what's my Ralph's or what's my you know Kroger or Jewel food store in, in uh, Chicago? Um, things like that. But long-term, use those stimulating things. Use music, use textures, use photographs, use people, brainstorm with somebody. I, I love, one of the things I love to do because my boys went through high school and you know grade school and high school and I've got the, with the little kids, I'm always saying, Let's do memory sessions with couples because that is fascinating. You do, uh, you know, there, there's always some mom who says, let's do it at my house. There's another, you know, I shouldn't say mom. There's a family who says, let's do it at my house. Somebody else says, I'll organize the catering. And I'll, I say, I'll do the entertainment and we'll get like eight couples together and we'll do memory sessions with couples because the memory, I mean, that is so much fun. And you could do it with friends. I mean, you could have a friend as part of your couple. So it's it's constantly working on it. It's constantly using other people. It's constantly using whatever resources you have. So if you're trying to remember something, and you know what, if you're visiting somebody who's like in memory decline or whatever, bring their dominant, you know, primary track and dominant sense 
If, they, if you know that your mother is a visual person, bring photographs. If you know she's auditory, bring music. People will not remember people, but sometimes they will remember entire passages of songs or the entire song. And think of movement, no matter what it is. Bring smells, bring taste, bring food, bring textures, bring a blanket, bring, uh, stimulate your memory constantly. And that's what's gonna bring back the old memories, for sure. Lifelong learning. Um, yes. You're the epitome of that and something that we really believe in here. Um, we're entering the same era of our lives. Um, and I've always said that uh, this era is a gift um, and can't be an exercise in denial. Right. You've watched your parents die young. So young, 52 um, and 58. We've all, the siblings have all outlived our parents. You now see that we have many people who are with us. Uh, I was with a lady yesterday in Westwood who's 105. Wow. A memory almost as good as yours. Wow. Bravo. Um, how do you think about old age? Well, and maybe because I have so many siblings, I don't know. We're all, we, we always feel like we're all going to be in some house together. You know, we're all going to be in some place that, you know, that takes care of. I, I don't know. I mean, I never, it's funny. I said this to my sister the other day. I said, I never feel old. I never feel old. She said, well, you are old. I go, yeah, but I don't feel it. I always just feel like me. Like you get on a train, a train car at a certain year of your life that you're born or whatever. And then you're at the stations along the way that you have to do things, but you're still you, you know? So I think I feel like, I just always feel like me and like, oh, this is going to be an adventure or this next thing is going to be this. So I don't know whether that attitude helps me or puts the rose colored glasses on or whatever, but there's just so much more I want to do and so many experiences. And now that we've all been like in lockdown for so long, you know, it, it's like there's a whole new world open. And I think we're going to, the world has reset and we've reset. I think people really distilled down during the whole pandemic, distilled down to the person that they are and what's important to them. You know, I'm about to take a road trip with my little niece and nephew and my boys are coming and Michael and my sister and her two the, her twin sons that are 24 and they're we're all going in two cars and we're going to like Joshua Tree and the Grand Canyon and we're going to hit Vegas and you know Winslow and Flags I mean we're going to do like a road trip the crater and everything else so I get to not only redo that because my kids did it I did it with them but now teach another I don't know I just see it as more traveling more people more great experiences with my family more learning more acting more hanging out with you. <laughs> so. so I think our audience can tell that we could do this for the rest of the afternoon. And <laughs> hopefully we'll get to for the rest of our lives. Yeah. I am so glad that you were able to work this in before you took that road trip. I can't yeah. wait to hear all about I uh, know. all those age groups uh, traveling together. I sure. think the, uh, you and I have talked about the, the importance of intergenerational activity. Um, absolutely. And, and how fun that can be, but also how good that can be for humanity. For, yeah, absolutely. All um, those things. Nearly, uh, you know, if we were sitting closer and we didn't have to be six feet apart, you would get a giant hug. Oh. I'm going to turn this back over to Debbie for any that would like to listen to more about Belmont Village. But this has been one of the most charged hours oh, I can thank remember. You so much. And I can't thank you enough for joining us thank here. Thank you. I'm so glad it worked out that we could be here together. Exactly. That's, That's what made it. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you both Mary Lou and Patricia. What a great discussion and look forward uh, to future discussions as well. Um, Belmont is an industry lead leader offering independent living, assisted living, and circle of friends for mild to moderate cognitive impairment and memory care for advanced dementia. To learn more and speak with a family advisor, please visit belmontvillage.com. Always remember it's never too early, nor is it too late to speak with an expert on memory care. Thank you all very much for attending this presentation.